Last we spoke for Knives Out at Fantastic Fest, we mostly chatted about being dads. We spoke about how your character in that film, Trooper Wagner, is the character that best captures your vibes with his goofy dad energy. So I feel like you kind of put a magnifying glass on that here. So would you say Blood Relatives has taken the mantle in in terms of best representing you, uh, fangs aside? You know, um, I, I still think that Trooper Wagner is probably a better dad than Francis in Blood <laughs> Relatives. You know, Francis in Blood Relatives is sort of figuring it all out as he goes. And, and, and I'm confident he is, you know, he does he does come through. He will come through. I, I think Francis is, is very much um, a dad who is trying hard uh, and coming from a good place. But, uh, but the dad thing seems to be at this point in my life inescapable. I think that um, I am I am now so fully invested for the rest of my life, frankly, in yeah. uh, in what this uh, what this is going to be like. That that it's just going to have an influence on on all of it. Yeah, for sure. I can't I can't tell you how much that line in here about a dad worrying about getting a paunchy belly and losing his hair like that, that, that hit, that hits home. But yeah. I love Victoria's character, uh, Jane, how she responds to it, essentially saying like, you've earned it after looking good for so long. But I, I, you know, he's still like a great cinematic dad, like he's compelling. And, and I'm wondering who have been some of the best cinematic dads in your growing up with watching movies? Like which characters kind of taught you about fatherhood outside of your own family? Oh, uh, well, you know, I mean, it, it, uh, I, I think in retrospect, you know, it's the dads who were vulnerable that yeah. have taught me the most, right. You know, I mean, a, a big one is H.I. McDonough in, in Raising Arizona, you know, a guy who definitely has a checkered past and probably has a checkered future. Yeah. Um, and yet, I think he is coming from a very good place in terms of, you know, wanting to, to be present for his family, wanting to have a family. For people of my generation, probably your generation, I think a lot about like, you know, Roger Murtaugh. I mm -hmm. think a lot about, um, uh, um, you know, uh, Wayne Zielinski. Uh, I think a lot about these dads who, uh, you know, and, and, and for those of us, uh, you know, Roger Murtaugh in, in Lethal Weapon movies or, or, or Wayne Zielinski and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I mean, I think the idea, and now, you know, it's funny, now I think about like Tony Soprano. Like I think yeah. about, you know, the, the idea of sort of um, not letting one's humanity and shortcomings get in the way of the bigger picture. Sure. Because this is, uh, this is a marathon. This is the rest of our lives. Yeah. Yeah. What's what's really cool about your film here is while all these exciting genre markings are here that I that I love and grew up with, like vampirism and, and beyond. But uh, you don't let that consume the, the grander markings about connection. Like there are a lot of thoughtful conversations here between people. Was there much of a eternal fight during the writing process to not get like I don't know, tractor beam toward the genre parts and allowed the that to steer the narrative? Did you have to like pump the brakes from time to time and be like, no, I, I'm, I'm getting away from the heart here? If anything, I think it was sort of the opposite. Um, mm. You know, I think that that, uh, you know, that the vampire movies and the genre movies that I love tend to be kind of subtle. They tend to be like, yeah. you know, the ganja and Hess or Martin. You know, those were some, some sort of big inspirations. And those are definitely vampire movies it's much easier to write about things that you know that you're experiencing so it wasn't difficult to write about how freaked out i was about becoming a dad or being scared or being worried about about what was going to come down the pipeline you know that part all kind of came very easily because it just was sort of what i was going through in the moment frankly mm. what i'm still going through the vampire stuff the genre stuff felt actually like it was more pressure because I felt like I owed it a lot, you know, as such a big fan, I, I kind of felt like, okay, well, now I have an opportunity, at least sitting here in front of a blank page to do what I want to do with vampires. Yeah. And so now I'm looking at all the vampire material that I've loved for so long and I'm going, all right, I, I guess I got to show up for it. I guess I got to, you know, kind of, you know, try, try to try to do right by it. In, in a way, it was, it was a lot, op a lot of the sort of the, the opposite experience, I think, from, you know, 
trying to write a vampire movie and then make it sentimental. I was writing a sentimental movie and then I kind of had the pressure of making it a vampire movie. <laughs> huh. Well, that, that's that's interesting to hear you say that just because I, I noticed how you tease certain things to kind of like show how much bigger the world may be. Like it's it's the details that are exciting and the, the genre fan in me gets really amped up and I'm like, okay, I need another movie that goes down this path. So like without spoiling anything, how much did you think beyond the the parameters of what we see here, whether that's further down the road for these characters, other characters in this world, or like the early history of these two? Oh, I, I thought a lot about it. I mean, that kind of helped me find, you know, the stuff that is in the movie that is sort of obvious, right? Is, you know, when I kind of thought of all these little details, what if the world looked like this on the outside? What if just on the other side of the camera, this other thing was happening? Or an event that happens just before or just after? Like, you know, all of that is the stuff that, that you want to do because, you know, you want to write the biggest, story you possibly can, or at least I did, you know, I, mm -hmm. I would have loved to have had an endless amount of, of time and money and energy to be able to kind of build this world. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, you know, you're, you know, or I wouldn't say unfortunately, I would actually say it's sort of the, you know, what is it is the, you know, you know, it's like limitations are the mother of invention. It was sort of like, mm -hmm. all right, how do I pepper those details throughout so that I don't lose them so that they're still mm -hmm. there? Um, but then really concentrate on what I have to with the capacity and the capabilities that we do have, if that makes any sense. So, you know, I, I, a part of me really hopes that there's a world where I'm able to talk more about the world and, and monsters and adventures that are happening concurrently or next or, or, or whatever. Um, but uh, it, again, it was just sort of about trying to kind of find the opportunities where I could at least wink at least kind of whisper that stuff because I yeah. want it all. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of details, is live, laugh, love going to be an ongoing theme through your directorial work? Because there's a, there's a sign in here, there's a sign in Mr. Uh, there's a bracelet in this one. So do, yeah. do you have one in your house? Like what's your relationship with the sign? We do not know. We do not have a live, laugh, love anything in the, in the house, thank goodness, because um, there's something about it that just feels like it. it is, you know, we live in a world right now where a lot of really normal sentiments mm. tend to carry a kind of dark weight. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about dog whistles. You talk to people who, um, you know, often don't pass for white men and they say, you know, I know when somebody is saying one thing and they mean another. And um, and uh, uh, um, and I think all that is very true. And I think that something like live, laugh, love, which are sentiments that you think to yourself, like, of course, live, laugh, love. That sounds great. I that I'm on board, you know. And then you realize that it is, you know, so often a sentiment that is co-opted by people who are not living, laughing, or loving uh, with the same uh, definition that we are. Yeah. And so I think that irony is very funny to me. I think it, um, and I think it, it kind of takes the piss maybe out of some people who, who need it. <laughs> Not mad. I'm disappointed. Impressed. <laughs> <laughs>